All right, everyone, that question, how many days a month do you experience stress related to work? It has been a tough year. And the nature of work, the location of work, basically all of the aspects that go into showing up to work have drastically changed. Is it been net positive? Is it intolerable? Somewhere in between. We're going to try to explore uh, the parameters of that and the impact on the choices that we make as we're planning out our path to financial independence. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. And and yeah, to your point, the nature of work, the very nature of work has changed dramatically just in the last year and change, which is, I mean, quite literally, it's a sea change, right? And we don't know what it's going to look like going forward. And that is both scary and really, really exciting for a lot of people, right? Like all of these things that we've just taken as, as sacrosanct, right? Like as part of just, this is how you do work. Well, we can question them now, right? And I think that is a really cool aspect just of general society right now. And also the Phi community, right? Like we are always at the forefront of thinking a little bit differently. And what does that look like for you? Jonathan, what does that look like for me, Brad? What does that look like for everyone listening to this, right? Like, what do you want your days and weeks and months to look like? And maybe they, that answer can be a little bit different than it was in January of 2020. And again, I think that's exciting. It is exciting. The other thing that's exciting is that we rapidly have our Red X month approaching. And, uh, we, I think, I think definition in terms can be really important, but it's one that we've been using, uh, for a couple of years now. And it's one that's become pretty sacred to the Barrett family household. But last year it was kind of ripped away from you to some degree. Oh, it was, it was unfortunately, obviously, obviously, unfortunately, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, our buddy Vincent Puglisi was on the podcast years ago and he introduced us to this concept, right? So it's basically when you control your schedule. You get to look at your calendar, you get to take a nice red marker and put a big old red X across a month or months <laughs> of your choosing, right? And Jonathan is uh, gesticulating wildly here in the background with a, <laughs> with a red marker. Shout out to any uh, West Wing fans out there. That's one of my, one of my favorite quotes. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you get to take this red marker and put a big red X over a month. And we have picked the month of August for our family. So in essence, uh, the last couple of years prior to 2020, we basically said, all right, August, kids aren't in school. We're not uh, stuck around swimming schedules, which is actually probably one of the biggest impediments to us uh, traveling and, and doing what we want is uh, swimming meet schedules at this point. But uh, August is just a month we can do what we want. So. We spent basically a month in England and Scotland in 2018. We spent basically a month in Maui, Hawaii in 2019. We we're going to do Alaska last year, but unfortunately that got canceled. So yeah, I mean, now it's exciting, right? I mean, the world to a large degree is, is on the precipice of opening back up here. And, you know, Jonathan, August 2021 is coming right around. So yeah, we're preparing that marker to put the big red X and say, hey, we can do what we want, right? Like we are not beholden to a schedule or a location or a job or whatever it is, right? Like we can do what we want. And I think that at its essence is, is the fundamental benefit of five. That is it. And to be honest, you know, Brad's uh, Red X month kind of got decimated last year. So there's some there's some makeup required here. You don't lose a Red X month. You double down the next year. Anyways, I'm just kidding. But what Brad and I did decide to do for the summer is uh, we are going to go to one episode a week for the summer period of time. It'll just take less coordination. It'll allow for a little bit more flexibility and freedom over the summer. And Hopefully, um, all of us will be able to spend a little bit more time with our family this summer, and this will be something that, you know, we're celebrating this right along with you guys. So I wanted to give you the heads up on that. But, you know, I think part of it goes back to this idea 
just generally of the the Mexican fisherman. Have you ever has anybody anybody familiar with this analogy? We we actually dropped it on the show a, a long time ago, and it's not one that's unique to us. It's been around for a long time. But the analogy goes, or the uh, the story goes, something like this: You have this Mexican fisherman on the beach, uh, and you know, in the morning he fishes, and the evening he brings back his catch and he and he spends it with his family. You have this American businessman that. Uh, goes down there and has all these suggestions for how he can scale and he can grow. And he's like, all right, well, you could, you know, you could buy two boats and then you could get a team of people, take out some loans so that you can do all of that. Uh, and then you'd be able to run your operations and bring in 10 times as much money. And the Mexican fisherman keeps pushing back and says, why? You know, what, what, what? Well, then you'd be able to get more and then you'd be able to scale more and then you'd be able to get bigger and you'd be able to grow farther and you'd be able to grow faster. And he says, why? And he, and why? And why? And why? And he's, and, the, and at some point the American businessman said, well, at, well then at that point, then your time, you have all the freedom of your time. And then you can just spend your evenings with your wife and kids and your family. And the Me Mexican fisherman says, well, I already get to do that. You know, I'm already there. I already have, I already have time freedom. I've, I've built out this foundation for what I need. I, I have you know, I have already time on my side. Do I really need to lean into this, you know, this lifestyle that you're describing that doesn't really sound that appealing to me when I already have it? And it's really, I think it's for us in the financial independence community, that should resonate with us a lot. Maybe not the exact analogy, but rather what are we pursuing? What is the goal? Is the goal to get, you know, fame and recognition and wealth or is the goal to reclaim our time and put our most precious non-renewable resource into the, to the people, the relationships, the community, the things that matter to us the most. And a lot of us just have no idea what matters to us the most. And so we just kind of latch on to what society tells us to do, which is to hop onto the American businessman approach and just have more of everything but that may not be necessary. And so Brad, I think that analogy is really critical for us and it's kind of been a guiding light. And we've actually seen this from people who kind of came before us in this, in this space, like Brandon, the mad scientist and, uh, you know, Pete from Mr. Money Mustache and many, many others where at some point, yeah, they could keep, you know, doing whatever it is that they're doing, but it's kind of like, well, what is my why of this? And even Vicki Robin, when you think about it, what is my why of this? It is to spend more time with my community, with my family. And I think that's just like really important for all of us just to keep in mind as what is your why? Yeah. And as you were going through that story, I mean, just so many, just short little, little words popped in into my head, which are balance enough, right? You said I'm already there, right? In that story and, and Vicki Robin with her, her life energy, right? That's what, what she talks about. And and I think it's so easy for all of us to get out of balance, right? I think that's, uh, that's something, you know, a lot of us who are in this community, we are, you know, sure we, we've taken a somewhat, as you would say, like get off the hamster wheel type approach, a countercultural, like we're not necessarily hard driving in the sense that we need to just accumulate tens of millions of dollars. We understand when it's enough, but I think many of us are because of the sheer fact that we're driven to get to this point of financial independence, we are driven, right? And we don't know sometimes where to find that balance. And I think, I think it's always important to find that, that center, right? And I think, I think that's something Jonathan, you and I have probably spent I mean, a hundred plus hours talking about on this podcast of just the psychological aspect of the path to FI and just how important it is to just keep coming back to what do you want your life to look like, right? Like, why are you doing this? What's the point? It's not just instead of measuring your success in, in number of dollars in your bank account, like in a normal, normal society, you know, then it's not just like, Hey, what's my savings rate, right? Like, Hey, let's compete over our savings rate or let's compete over anything. There should be no competition. It should just be, okay, this is maybe the first time in my life I can figure out what do I actually want my life to look like? And I think it's critical that everybody comes back to that really often because I gotta be honest, like my life sometimes, and right now probably is, is out of balance. It feels out of balance and whether it is or it isn't when I actually, if I did a time audit, I would probably look at my life and say, 
holy cow, this is unbelievable. You know, like it's amazing how much time I do have, but sometimes it doesn't feel like that. And, and I think that's something critical, you know, when we talk about like how much stress do you feel at your job or even more broadly in your life, right? Like you need to come back to that point of centering and say like, all right, what, what are we doing here? Right? Like at its essence, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to just grow, grow, grow? Are we trying to whatever? Or are we trying to get back to what are those things that light me up, right? Like, who do I want to spend time with? How do I want to spend my time? What do I want to learn? It doesn't mean don't learn. It doesn't mean don't explore new things. It just means like, are you actually doing the things that you want to be doing? So yeah, I mean, there's Jonathan, this is like a, you know, it's funny as, as I'm talking, I'm realizing like how deep the well goes on this, right? On like just how important of a topic this is. And like, how many little tendrils it has in not only your life, but just the entire concept of five. You know, there's this, uh, this phrase that stands out to me, what got you here won't get you there. And when I actually, I was giving the financial independence community actually a lot of credit for saying we put more time thinking about our why, but I got to say the nature of our community which is a earn more, spend less, optimize the difference community is such that we typically are at least the path to get to this point, disproportionately the American businessman. We are disproportionately the go-getter. We are going to outperform our peers. We're going to negotiate for raises. We're going to, uh, we're going to potentially change departments, change industries to look for better opportunities. We're going to look at our expenses and and look at cutting almost to the point of deprivation so that then we can come back and we can find that sweet spot. We are going to be optimizing. And some of our validation early on comes from hitting maybe stages of FI or checkpoints of FI, watching our bank account grow, watching our investments grow, watching our portfolio getting closer to the point where working is optional. But let's say you get there, right? Let's say, let's say you get to this point and this point is approaching, starting to feel like you are getting really close to financial independence and your validation, your proof of success has really been your investments growing. When you get to that enough point, do you have the, the courage? It's not even courage because it's not a bad thing per se, but do you, are you at risk of losing sight of your wife for getting there to begin with? To say, well, you know what? Look, I actually got here three years ahead of time. So if I were to do another, you know, five or six years here, I could probably double or triple what my initial goal was, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's something like that. Do you, do you lose sight of that initial vision? Now, no one is telling you, you have to walk away when you hit a certain number, but I will say that what got you here, what got you to the point where you're, where you're earlier than expected to your path to financial independence, what got you there is not the same thing as what's going to get you to the point where you're unwinding and you're drawing down and you're kind of kind of stepping away from maybe a corporate hamster wheel, you know, and you're simplifying your life to focus on what your initial why was. It is just, it's a different mindset. And I can tell you, it's going to be for all of us when we're, when we're battling with that, it's going to take some courage to, uh, to start to step away, especially if starting to step away is earlier than expected. You know, Brad, what is that? What is that? It's that one more year syndrome. This is one more year syndrome is always there hanging over your shoulder. And sometimes it has, you know, maybe some, a lot of reasons why you should, a lot of very, very good reasons to stay one more year. And maybe they are, but what's driving it and how is that affecting your initial why for why you got started pursuing financial independence? Yeah. That one more year syndrome, I think so much of it is based around the scarcity mindset, right? Like, am I going to have enough? Do I have to keep doing this? What if, what if, what if, and you know, some of that clearly, I mean, there's some validity to gaming out scenarios and, and I'm not trying to, to minimize or, or downplay that, but, but I think it's, it's easy to get caught in that mindset of there's never enough. I have to grasp at everything and, you know, I need to stay one more year, which turns into two more years, which turns into 10 more years, right? Because it's easier that way, frankly, right? Like we know that <laughs> we know it's easier to just keep doing what you're doing. And that is not really doing the hard work, right? Like doing the hard work is 
is the psychological aspect. And, and I know I said this a couple of minutes ago, but, but it really is. And it's also, it's incumbent on you to do that work mentally years before you even contemplate leaving a job or changing your life dramatically. Because sure, it sounds great that I'm going to do X, right? Like I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to learn a new language every month. You know what I mean? Like this all sounds great, but what happens when you've never done any of that stuff and you up and quit your job and then you start traveling and you find out real quickly, you don't really enjoy it. Like it's tedious. You like having a routine. You don't like moving every couple of days or weeks or whatever it is, right? Like was your entire FI journey, was that a waste then? I mean, I suspect some people would think, oh, wow, what, what am I going to do now? What was this all worth it? Was there any point to this? And I think what we advocate, Jonathan, is, is doing that work ahead of time and starting to experiment, right? Like you can experiment small. It's funny. Like when we started this podcast, we called it experiments in financial independence. And, you know, we, we did kind of, you know, never really, really hash that out as, as we probably envisioned in, in 2016, though, maybe you could make the argument that in, in a lot of ways we have, but, uh, but I think maybe that has shifted to what if the experiments in financial independence aren't just, Hey, I'm going to put a couple thousand dollars in real estate and I'm going to put a couple thousand dollars in this, but what if the experiments of financial independence are in your head, right? Like what if it's the work, if it's the psychological work you need to do to figure out what the heck do I want to do with my life? What do I want my job to look like? Right? Like what if that is the experiment? I, uh, I had a, a friend that was freelancing all of last year when, uh, their industry just kind of got decimated and only within the last month, you know, got back with a, with a kind of a major corporate employer, found himself desperate for contact with an employer, desperate for meetings, desperate for bureaucracy, desperate for Zoom calls, like even if it's remote work, you know, just wanted that interaction. And uh, that is not the case for me <laughs> personally. <Yeah. laughs> I can't imagine that. But at the same point, I don't know if I'm good at vacations, you know, or I don't know if I'm good at checking out and being out without thinking about work or responsibilities or the next thing, or kind of the American businessman lifestyle, you know, like I, I, I personally struggle to, I'm always thinking of something related to choose FI. I'm always thinking of something related to talents. I'm always thinking of some sort of system or process that can be dialed in or improved. I, um, I don't, I think I would have a panic attack if I had a month of nothing, you know, of nothing related to this community or to town stacker. Um, and that's a little like scary for me. That's not a, that's not a, that's not a good thing, right? That's, that's not a good thing. That's not a, that's not an appropriate mindset. It tells me that I'm, that I'm out of sync, that I'm out of balance. It tells me that when I'm with my kids, I'm thinking about something work related, you know? And, and, and uh, although it's different than my buddy who found himself wanting to be back at, you know, work, like, does that mean that I've lost sight of, of my why? I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this on public display for consumption to prompt other people to kind of go down their own path and figure out, is that true for them? But to really be able to be somewhere and get contentment from, you know, working on a, uh, I build a tree, I build a little birdhouse with my son yesterday. Uh, yeah. My wife got us this hobby lobby type project and it was, I mean, it was horrific. The thing just, I mean, it, we were, we were dealing with glue and a hammer and the nails and you know, these nails are basically made out of aluminum foil. You take one bend that's slightly out and it just bends in half and, and anyways, not that being said, but that was the, <laughs> so a very low stress endeavor. I take it. <laughs> it's <was horrible. laughs> but that was like the first time I'm doing this project with my son. And I realized like over the course of this 30 minutes of frustration, um, I wasn't thinking about anything else. I was, and I was like, how often is this the case where I'm working on a project that's creating something that does not involve sitting in front of a computer and I'm not thinking of anything else, even when I'm getting angry and irritated and cursing under my breath at the, the poor quality of the, the, the materials that I've been handed to build this thing with, I'm still like, yeah, this is good. This is, I should be doing more of this. So what does this look like doing like a garden box or creating a garden in the backyard, doing more projects or whatever, going, going to the, my family went to the zoo this past week. 
and asked me if I wanted to come. And I said, nah, I got some stuff I got to do here. And I spent the entire day working in front of the computer, getting it done. And I was like, oh, I missed opportunity. You know, I could, I could do this. I can do more of this. This is my why I just missed that opportunity and maybe forever missed it. And if I had gone, I probably would have been thinking of all the things that I needed to do at work the entire time and making plans for how I could do it, you know, in a faster, more efficient way. Is this how you go through life when you're, when you're with your family, when you're doing these things, are you able to go back into this idea of being present and being content? And, and this brought me up to a conversation, Brad, that we started to have the other day. And it's really, it's difficult. I think more in the entrepreneur space, which, um, you know, has its tentacles in me for sure, uh, more in the entrepreneur space, but it's that idea that, uh, if you are not doing anything, if you're not aggressively pursuing, you know, building some aspect of your business, then you're being, you're being complacent. You're being complacent, right? And I don't think the entrepreneur community generally has any notion of what contentment means. You know, it's, it's no, not contentment. It's no, we're going to be relentless. You know, that's, let's trade it for that. Um, contentment is a sign of weakness. And that's something that, you know, I wonder, I feel like you've done generally a better job handling this. And I don't know exactly why that is. Cause i to be honest with the two of us, you've kind of been in the entrepreneurial space for longer. Um, but I do feel like you're at least one or two steps ahead of me on the contentment side. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily true, but, uh, but, but I guess I've tried and I, I think, uh, maybe that's, that's something that it has been in the back of my mind of, of that work life balance, you know, and, and this gets to, you know, stress and what are we doing? Right. Like, as you were saying, like there's so many echoes of what you described from the entrepreneurship community to just regular life. Right. And how the Phi community differs, which is you're even saying like, okay, if I'm not thinking about how am I going to grow, how am I going to make this bigger? How can I work on this? How can I make this more efficient? Like then I'm, I'm wasting my time or I'm not working hard enough, right? Like we see that in, in regular life, right? No, in just a regular W2 job, you know, like most of us have. And like, if you're not trying to get a new career and, and get an advancement and get a raise and get a new job title, like then you're failing, you know, like that's, that's the common societal sentiment. And I think those of us in the five community have said, no, 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 that doesn't have to be the goal, right? Like, I can have enough. I can figure out a path to have enough. Maybe like we talked about, I mean, this has probably been hundreds of episodes since we've talked about this, but like, what about, what if you had that power, you know, that, uh, that F you money, as we say, the, uh, <laughs> freedom unlimited money, right. Uh, to say, Hey, there are these three aspects of my job that I love and everything else I really don't feel like doing, right? Like, what would it look like if you went into your boss and asked her like, Hey, how do I do this? How do I get to a point where I don't want to be doing these meetings? I don't want to be doing these TPS reports. Like this is where I add value. This is what lights me up. Like, because you're in a position of strength, you could do a part time. You could do, you know, you can actually look at this and design a work life that actually works for you as opposed to working for the company, right? And like, isn't that such a novel idea, right? And I think, Jonathan, if I have done one thing right in, in entrepreneurship, it's that I've understood where I can potentially add value and I've understood where, like what lights me up and you know, what, like I, I kind of, as woo woo as a sense, I kind of like follow my energy. Like, and I, and I find that because I've found one of the things I do when I'm not interested in, in doing something is I procrastinate. Like I am the worst procrastinator in the world when it's something that for whatever reason I have this like mental block about, but so then I realized, okay, I'm going to be the constraint in the system. Right. And like, how many times have you heard me say that? Like, I don't want to be the constraint. So dot, dot, dot. And that means like, if I'm, if it means like going to a meeting and just like with my negative energy, because I don't want to be there, like 
just I have witnessed that negative me. energy on a meeting, and I wish you weren't there either on some of those. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, it's horrible. Like, nobody was. <laughs> so like, <laughs> uh, the constraint so is here. Do? Oh, great. <laughs> 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 I see who we got today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, I just wouldn't go to them anymore. And you know, that's obviously that's a decision I can make as you know one of the you know co-founders of the company, I suppose. But like. But I think I think it's on, on a much more broad scale, like it's important to know where do you add value and what do you get value from? And like, how do you design a job that works around that? You know, and, and I think so. So, yeah, I think that would be like I said, if there's one thing I've done well, it's like I stay in my lane and, you know, my lane can add a lot of value in a lot of senses. But there are a lot of things where I'm just wasting people's time and I just I don't want to be involved in that. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of. I think that's probably the biggest thing I've done is like that stay in my lane, but like it, I can add overwhelming value from those few things. You know, there are going back to one of the things we were talking about earlier in the episode, we were talking about just kind of the, the, the entire landscape of work has shifted and the, the pivot to remote work options. I mean, we're, we're never going back. You might go back, but it's probably for many industries, it's because you didn't think about this ahead of time how you can leverage this, you know, this huge shift in culture, uh, you can leverage this on your behalf to get more of what you want and less of where you feel like you are a constraint. Every company is pondering the implications of not having to have as much, uh, real estate for their operations. Um, and whether or not is net positive or net negative, they are seeing some, uh, they're seeing massive positives. There's a few things that they're concerned about. Uh, but you as individuals have a chance to be a squeaky wheel and to think through what is the ROI that they're looking for, look at it from your employer's perspective, and then present to them an opportunity to save money and increase ROI and get more, you know, can just get, just unlock the doors of opportunity by encouraging a potentially at least occasional remote work policy. Uh, and I would just say, this is the time to actually dig into this and, and look into this. Maybe we could do more of an episode around this topic. It's probably a little bit outside the scope today, but don't let this pass you by. Like if remote work in any way appeals to you, if you feel like that would unlock some percentage of time that you could then, you know, be more effective, more efficient. And let's be very clear ahead of COVID. There were many people that thought commuting an hour and 15 minutes, both ways, you know, Twice a day, Monday through Friday, that was the norm. And that's if traffic was good and that was fine. And they just don't have to do that anymore. And you might never have to do that again. A lot of you used to listen to a podcast during that same window, <laughs> might I add? Just <laughs> <laughs> maybe two at a time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I would be look. I would be looking into that. You know, I, I mean, really, if take advantage of this. You've had to deal with a lot. You've had to take a lot this last year. How can we lock this in? And I will just say. It's going to probably be an ongoing conversation. It's probably going to be a negotiation. And just as a place to start, it's probably not about you, right? When you go in and tell your boss, if you start the conversation with, hey, I want to do this for me, you're not going to get as far as if you think about the opportunities for them and the opportunities for the team. You're representing, you know, what would be best for the team as a whole and what they could expect. And then, you know, maybe presenting a low risk way that they could start to test whether or not this is, you know, true or too good to be true. So Brad, I wanted to go back to that initial question of how many days a month do you experience stress related to work? And we can start with maybe just an actual answer to that question. If you have one available, I say this is actually even source. Someone in our Facebook group was posting this to the community. And I thought that's really fascinating because like work is not always going to be stress-free. That's going to be an unreasonable expectation. Um, you know, if that's the litmus test, you can never have stress related to work. Come on. You know, this is not utopia clearly, but in reality, what is a reasonable burden for, you know, stress related days at work and what is toxic? What's, what's the line of delineation? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And, and of course it's going to be person dependent and also what's your definition of stress, right? Like if we're talking about like, is it a perfectly stress-free day? You know, does, is that the only bar that counts? I mean, then I think the answer you're going to have, uh, pretty much all of your days are going to have some, some stress, obviously that's, that's not what we're we're talking about here, but, but I think to me, this, this comes back more to your, your thing you were talking about, like when you're with, when you're with your family, you're thinking about work, when you're at work, you're maybe thinking about, oh, did I miss that 
that zoo trip that, you know, maybe it was the first time my daughter went to the zoo and, you know, she fed a giraffe for the first, you know, like you might have missed that forever, right? Like, you know, are you going to look back 90 years from now and say, oh my God, I missed the the first giraffe visit? Probably not. But like, you know, it, but in the moment like that, you know, that is a first, right? So I, I think the larger point is. In all fairness, my daughter would not go near the giraffe. She was terrified <laughs> of them. So I'll have another chance for that one. But nice. your point nice. well nice. taken. Nice. <laughs> 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 oh, that's great. Um, so, I mean, to me, like where, where I think I experienced stress the most, and again, this goes back to like, know thyself and, and do the work, right? Do the mental work. Like if I am looking on an absolute basis, my stress level is very low, but that doesn't mean day to day. I don't feel stressed and I don't feel significantly stressed because I, I actually do. And I, and I think that is more of a function of being out of balance than, than the objective reality of my stress level. And that doesn't minimize my feelings or my thoughts, right? Like it doesn't minimize those, that concept of stress by any means. But, but I think on an intellectual level, I do understand that it's like a, a very low absolute level of stress. But I think, I think when, when I really get down to it, it's, it's that feeling of being kind of half there, no matter where you are. Mm. Right. Mm. And, and that is just not, it's not a good feeling and it's not good enough. It's just not good enough for a life. Right. Like when, I mean, if you ask probably, I, you know, I haven't asked them, but I, I would almost guarantee what the answer is. If you ask my kids or wife, like, you know, what's the biggest thing you'd like to see improved with, you know, with dad or, or, or Brad, whatever is, just like being there and not like sneaking back up to the computer, right? And, Do you still sneak oh, up just, to the computer? I gave you credit a long time ago for when you're away, you're away. Are you just, I know, man. It's uh, I backslid. You know, it, it is. It unfortunately, it's when it, we it started happened. this, people. When we started this, back, I couldn't if I didn't message him at the allocated time. <laughs> it would be a week before I had heard from him. Like, it, like the man was unreachable. Yeah. I've gotten worse though. I really have. And, and, and it ebbs and flows, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and I hope that it's like, I, I feel like I'm in probably in a, in a bad period right now. And, uh, you know, it's something that I'm really am trying to work on. And I, I think if, to me, it just comes down to like, okay, if I could carve out a time, if I could carve out even like two or three hours and just sit down, leave my phone away, sh basically like shut down the extra web browser windows, you know, all the things that plague us, shut down mm -hmm. email, whatever it is, and just work. Like I could get most of, I could have a pretty productive three hours, you know, and that would feel good. And then uh, I put it down and then I go spend time with my family or go exercise or go and like, don't feel guilty. Like it's a constant feeling of guilt, you know? And, and I think, I think a lot of us feel that it's like, we're not, we're never doing enough. It's never good enough. And I think we need to have some like self-compassion. Like first, I think that's probably where a lot of this starts and just realize like life isn't perfect. We're certainly not perfect. And we're just trying to be a little bit better every day. But rest assured, like you do have to, you have to do the work. You got to try, you got to make an effort. Like it's not, well, it's better to realize it than to simply not realize it and still continue doing it. It's better to realize it, obviously, but it's still not good enough, right? Like I have now, at, I'm at the point where I'm conscious of this, but still, I probably haven't taken the steps that are necessary to make it better. So, you know, I guess long story short, we all experience stress at work, obviously in many different ways. Like you said, you know, there are significant commutes for people, there are toxic environments, there are, you know, bad uh, bosses, there are, you know, low salary or not feeling like you're getting paid enough or unfairly compensated. Like, believe me, believe me, you know, just about everybody has it worse than me. So this is not a, an oh, poor me scenario, but it, it's more just trying to say like, we all do experience this. And I think we need to just take a real critical eye and, and look at, Hey, what is, what is, what do our jobs look like? And like, how can we maybe make that situation better? both externally, like in many of those negative situations that I was talking about, but internally also. You know, what you said there was, uh, it stood out to me. You were describing, you know, stress related, but then you kind of actually bridged it in two different directions. And I was thinking about, it doesn't just fall on this one singular source of stress or one type of stress. There's actually 
it's important to point out it can go in many different directions. If you're going to do a root cause analysis, is this stress because your job at the income level you're making doesn't pay the bills? You're not compensated where you need to be compensated for the type of work that you're doing. You don't feel valued or appreciated for what it is that you're bringing to the table. You're in a toxic environment where you're being berated or demeaned, something along those lines on a regular basis, either externally by the customers you're interacting with or internally by management. You're in a situation where you are just exhausted on Fridays, you have no emotional energy left, and you're terrified of going into Mondays. And everything in the middle meets your expectations for how horrible it's going to be you know, a truly toxic environment. And then there's, you know, this is a spectrum, but you get to the other side of this and you have the kind of the dream list of things that we would hope for in our lives. And work is bringing a lot of these autonomy, mastery, purpose, identity, connection. I mean, your job, the way that you earn income is fulfilling all of these for you and you can't shut it off. You cannot stop thinking about it. And the stress comes from the fact that your personal life is not where it should be because your attention is wrapped up in all of this over here. And it's just right to point out, like when you say stress, what's the root cause analysis of that stress? Because the way that you would handle those, depending on where it's on the spectrum, is very, very different. I think that root cause analysis is critical for you. We're gonna have to figure out a strategy to solve this, right? If it's the former, we've got to do some soul searching on how quickly we can adjust this. I would feel very little loyalty to a situation that meets that prior criteria. And I will say, actually, as I think about it, pharmacy kind of, pharmacy kind of fell in that former category. I had, um, I was working in a pretty rough location. I had um, a pretty tough crowd that I was interacting with generally. Um, I did not feel like I had significant support from upper management. Um, I did not really feel like I was valued in terms of, you know, showing up and the energy I was bringing and what, I, and, and to be honest, I didn't really see a clear way to differentiate myself either. I could tell that at the end of the day, they needed a person there with a pulse and they could swap me out basically at a minute's notice and to, you know, go much farther than that. There was a real clear point of diminishing returns there. So I did not feel indispensable and then I did not see a clear way to make myself indispensable while preserving my sanity. Uh, so does that make sense? So, so, you know, for, for me, uh, it kind of posed an interesting inflection point because you now have eight years, 12 years on a particular professional career track in this industry. And I was kind of weighing the options of, all right, I need to do this for about 10 more years based on my estimates and my savings rate, and I can get there. And so do I want to do this here? Would I want to move across the street and go with a different chain? Would I want to change industries entirely? Would I want to start completely from scratch uh, in a new industry altogether? You know, or would I want to start my own business? That for me, you know, those are just kind of some of the things that I'm considering and people know how the story went. Ultimately, what gave me the ability to do what we ended up doing here at Choose that I was FU money. It was being on the path to financial independence. It was paying off all my debt. It was getting several years of expenses completely saved up. So I had some financial security to allow me to flex some entrepreneurial muscles. Uh, in retrospect, if I knew, I mean, now, I mean, I'm very, don't get me wrong. I'm very happy we did what we did with Choose FI and it's worked out beyond my wildest dreams. But, you know, if I had the full scope of information that I have now, I would have been very confident that I could have just retrained into another industry and made even more than I was making as a pharmacist within a relatively short period of time without going back to school, using a skill-based certificate for pro program that would give me remote work flexibility and an awesome Ohana environment to work in. And we've talked about that on the show, but that would be just like knowing what your options are if you find yourself in that toxic environment you know, that is one way of dealing with one very, very stressful situation. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of that is, is like kind of testing small, right. And that we usually talk about that in terms of entrepreneurship, right. So don't burn the boats and, you know, quit your job and walk out in, in a huff, you know, yelling and cursing at people, right. Like that's eh, probably not the best strategy, you know, but again, like what can you do? tomorrow to make your life a little bit better, right? That might mean reskilling. It might mean 
putting the finishing touches on the resume that you haven't contemplated updating in, in a couple of years. And even though you hate your job, right. Or you don't like your company, right? Like, okay, well, what's an easy thing you can do tomorrow is you can update your resume, right? Just little action steps to get the ball rolling. You can, if you, you know, really felt like you could try to negotiate a salary. If it's just, Hey, I'm being underpaid. I mean, we've had multiple segments on the podcast, Jonathan, you can give the references on that, but about, Hey, do the research. There are companies like Glassdoor and the like, where you can get competitive analysis of, Hey, what am I earning versus what should I be earning? What are other people in my job, my job capacity earning at other companies? You can interview with those other companies, right? Like, and then you have a leverage point. If you actually did like your company, uh, you know, that's, that's something you can do. You can, like we said, you can test small in terms of entrepreneurship. Is there something you've always wanted to do, always wanted to learn? There's never been a lower cost way or time to experiment with entrepreneurship than, than now, right? They're so easy. Like, and, and granted it's daunting. I'm not, I'm not trying to say like, you're going to have overnight success. That's not the point here. I hope, I hope that's coming through. Like you can test small, you can test small without as Alan Donegan, our friend from rebel entrepreneur says like, you don't need to have the business plan and get $300,000 in debt and rely on somebody else. Like you can do this and get the sale before you even create the product, right? For a lot of people, you can actually test like, is this viable? Is anybody going to pay for this? You can create, I mean, I know there are obviously there are thousands of, of websites, but they all, you know, millions, sorry. I know there are thousands of websites in, in our niche. There are millions and millions and millions of websites just in, in, in the world. And they all start from somewhere and certainly not all of them are going to be successful, but, but what does it cost to start one? It costs very, very little it costs maybe $20. And I mean, that's a remarkable thing that you can theoretically start a new business for sub $20. You can create a podcast for virtually nothing, right? Like all of these things, if you want to dip your toes in and maybe you don't have grand aspirations, maybe you just want to learn a skill, right? I mean, Jonathan, think of all the skills that you learned. I mean, both of us, but you, especially like, you know, four years ago, you were a pharmacist and now you are as much of an authority on independent podcasting as exists anywhere. And I mean, that's just self-directed learning. So, you know, sure, A, that's a pat on the back for you, but but more importantly, like anybody can do this type of self-directed learning. There's never been a better time to just learn for free or vir or really virtually free, right? Like, you know, YouTube, Khan Academy, Coding Academies, Google Certificates. There are, you know, things like like Salesforce, like we've talked about over and over here. Like there are ways to get significant jobs and significant skills for zero to, you know, a, a pittance of money, really, you know, a couple thousand dollars at most. I mean, that is remarkable. Gone are the days when you needed to spend years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to get somebody else's stamp of approval. Like that to me might be the sea change of all of this. Like you don't need somebody else's stamp of approval anymore. You can just prove that you can do it because you have the skills. And I think that is what underpins all of this. Like you, it's on you. And I mean, that's scary for a lot of people, right? Like, but it's on you. And that is wonderful for most of us that you can get up and make a change. And I mean, damn, if, if, if there isn't something more empowering than that, I don't know what it is. And you mentioned in there, you know, if, if it comes down to it, you know, negotiating your worth, negotiating your salary. Uh, we did a great episode. It was with financial mechanic. It was episode 211 of our podcast. And she actually gave us seven of her negotiation tips and literally a script template that you can use to help negotiate your salary. Uh, and you can define that you can go to chooseify.com slash two one one. It's all right there on the page. I mean, I think that, that that's a good framework, Brad, for really describing this and having people think through those, you know, that root cause analysis for uh, stress related to work. The other half of that is maybe more an idyllic scenario. It's no less serious. You need to think through it in terms of, you know, the impact long-term, but that, you know, when your work is your dream setup, but you, 
it's stealing or robbing from your ability to be present with your loved ones, with your family. You know, we have a luxury of, you know, thinking through this, maybe at a slightly slower pace and slowly optimizing, but there's a great book and it's actually an episode we did. And Brad, maybe you can look up the number on that while I talk about it with John Zeratsky from Make Time. In terms of getting back to balance, you know, balance has some certain characteristics that are identifiable and it feels like your time is in your control and you're able to allocate it where you want. And sometimes you just need to make the time. And when you have all of those characteristics that we talked about, autonomy, I get to work on whatever I want to work on mastery. I get to be, I get to fail at things until I master them. Uh, purpose. I feel like what I'm doing matters. Identity. You know, I know who I am and and why I'm here on this earth and connection. I have the connection of people around me. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's worth it just to then focus on that last piece, which is control of your time. You should be able to control your time. If all those prior statements are true, you have more power than you think you have. And uh, it's time to flex that it's time to flex it. So that's really where we wanted to wrap up this episode. It's a, it's a point of accountability for us personally to realize maybe we are struggling personally with this, this, this ladder that we just mentioned. Uh, but all of us are struggling with stress related to work, probably if we're not thinking about it in some capacity. And what are your options? You do have options. And it's just worth considering what do you want to take action on this week? And Brad just copied me on the link. If you want more information on that interview we did with John Zaratsky, you can find that at choosefi.com slash 168. It would be worth your time. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. 